Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for another of the National Library's virtual events. Earlier this week, we celebrated Scottish plant lore with Greg Kenniser of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh. Today, we continue our nature theme with Amanda Edmiston. Amanda is a professional storyteller with a background in herbal medicine based in Scotland, but in pre-COVID times, she also worked internationally. Her work blends folklore, traditional tales, social history and herbal remedies using storytelling techniques designed to evoke the magical world of plants. Today's session is part of her ongoing project, The Very Curious Herbal, inspired by Elizabeth Blackwell, a pioneering Scotswoman who, in 1737, became the first woman to publish a herbal. A treasured copy of this book is held in our library's collection. As part of her work, Amanda has looked not only at Blackwell's fascinating story, but uses the illustrations in A Curious Herbal as a starting point to explore the legends and lore associated with the plants, as well as some of the ways in which they are used. At the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity to answer some questions, so please feel free to add any that occur to you during today's event to the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, over to you, Amanda. Hi, thanks Joe. thanks for that lovely introduction and hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for my look at the world of Elizabeth Blackwell. Now I know one or two of you have uh, mentioned that you saw my early last year's event with the National Library uh, live from that beautiful building on George Forth Bridge um, and so you've heard my introductory look at Elizabeth and her work. But for those of you who didn't catch the first chapter, I'd like to start with a little look at Elizabeth Blackwell. She was born Elizabeth Blackery in Aberdeen around the beginning of the 18th century. The daughter of a, a wealth student. Now, although she was born into a, a fairly privileged position, it's worth remembering that at this time, the role of women was very different to what it is today. Even the most basic education was really not at the hands of most young women. However, Elizabeth was fairly lucky. As one of seven sisters, she, her parent, parents were, were fairly forward thinking. And it's evident from her work and, uh, that, and her later adventures that this is a woman that has quite a lot of information about quite a lot of subjects. Now, I would like to mention at this point, because botany or the study of plants and especially plant illustration is quite often seen as a very teal and ladylike occupation shedding some light on the early part of the 18th century are the words of the Reverend Polwelt, who writing nearly 50 years after Elizabeth published her book, described the idea when talking about Mary Wollstonecraft of girls and boys botanizing together as scandalous. He thought it was against the teachings of God, that this was not a role fit for respectable young women. Our Elizabeth, however, clearly has a, a degree of skill and artistry and understanding of plants. Her detailed illustrations in her herbal that she creates a little later in her life show a real understanding of the time and what should draw the eye when we're looking at plants and trying to recognise them in our surroundings. As I say, she was born into a forward-thinking family in a forward-thinking town. Aberdeen, her place of birth, has always been known for its innovation and its ability to uh, in take on new ideas. In the Aberdeen of Elizabeth's childhood, this ran to the prosaic road sweeping. Street lighting had just been introduced and uh, letting up on the previous century and a half of witch burning, at least for a little while, just to give themselves long enough to regroup and become the heartland of the Jacobite rebellion. 
I'm painting a picture now of the landscape our heroine grows up in. She decided to get married and her marriage was a little controversial. Her beloved Alexander Blackwell um, was son of the Dean of Marshall College, one of the oldest, oldest universities. And um, unfortunately, however, although he was said to be very good at languages, was a bit of a blagger. The pair eloped, getting out of Aberdeen and making for London after young Alexander's credentials as a medical doctor were called into question. Now, I mentioned Elizabeth's um, status as a, a modern young woman of her time. It's worth saying that the law of coverture, where a woman's belongings immediately become her husband's on marriage, did not apply in Scotland. And I wonder if the forward-thinking Blackwells rather adhered to this idea once they'd reached London, because the records show Elizabeth set Alexander up with her money in the printing business. His latest venture didn't last long. His reputation was damaged. He hadn't undergone the correct type of apprenticeship and um, he fell into deep debt. He ended up in Highgate Debtors Prison and his resourceful wife was left on her own as a single parent with a young child. Now, she didn't hightail it back up to Aberdeen, although she would have been forgiven for doing so. But she took to walking in the nearby grounds of Chelsea Physic Garden, a beautiful walled garden, for those of you that don't know it, where one of the first greenhouses was built. A garden that was rented by eminent plant collector and doctor, Sir Hans Sloan, to the Royal College of Apothecaries. The place had some of the top gardeners, brilliant apothecaries and doctors regularly visiting its grounds. They had a great collection of books and Elizabeth decided to start painting and cataloguing the plants that grew there. 500 cups of plants commonly used for the purpose of physic. But what I would like to start with today is a little look at the opening pages. She starts not with the exotic coffee or cucumber. She doesn't start with tamarind or turmeric, although you can find those in the pages of her book. She starts with plants that you would pass walking any pathway anywhere in Britain dandelion, nettle, shepherd's purse. She draws these plants with the same attention to detail that later on she gives to seaweeds and corals, the branches of exotic and familiar trees. Each plant is accompanied by notes. Now, over the years, a number of uh, experts have claimed that Elizabeth did not write about the plants, that she took her work in on a weekly basis to visit her husband whilst looking after her children and got him to write the notes. I think this is very unlikely. I suspect that this was a little bit of a um, story woven by the Blackwells in order to bypass the criticism of a woman working in this way in these days. I suspect that with all those books and experts close at hand, Elizabeth wrote the notes that she drew from books such as Gerard's Herbal and Culpepper herself. Maybe her husband, gifted as he was in languages, added the long list of names given to those plants in different languages, but I suspect that a huge amount of the work was Elizabeth's own. I imagine walking with Elizabeth in a meadow near her hometown of Aberdeen, a meadow going down to the banks of the River Dee walking through the farmland surrounding their home and hearing stories 
of fairies, footnotes about folklore, learning from those around her of the traditions that we maybe think are fringed with superstition in this day and age, but at the time would have been commonplace. These simple plants that she starts with, the, the cleavers, as I mentioned, have changed in the way that the role and the way we look at them today. You have to imagine that this is a world where cleavers, Gallium apparine, sticky willies, as they're known in Scotland, once associated with uh, love divination, you were said to be able to throw them at your beloved and see if it stuck. If it stuck, they loved you back. If it fell, they did not. You'll all know the plant wherever you are around the world. It's twisting form is now wreathing and entwining its way up through every bush on the paths near my home. It's my, my children joke and say it was the source of inspiration for whoever invented Velcro. It's now commonly used by herbalists as a lymphatic, but in those days it was still gathered and sold as a vegetable. There are records from early 18th century London saying it was sold in Covent Garden Market. We can't imagine being sold cleavers or sticky willies now in the marketplace as a fresh vegetable, but in those days it was. Eminent doctors talked about its use as a curative for skin ulcers and other problems. And it's not the only plant that is so common on, on our hedgerows and, and meadows that we now overlook it and dismiss it as a weed that Elizabeth shares. I imagine her walking through that meadow, down to the river, a hand gracing through swathes of meadow sweet. Meadow sweet, fill a pendula was used for 100, 200 years before Elizabeth was born as a strewing herb. A century before her arrival in this country, she was preceded by Queen Elizabeth, 100 years before, off on a tangent. Queen Elizabeth is said to have had no other plant as a strewing herb other than meadowsweet, philopendula. And this plant, as many of you may know, is the source of salicylic acid, what the um, modern chemist will tell you is the source of aspirin, except the pendula is a little bit more clever than aspirin in many ways. Instead of reacting with the gut lining and making it inflammatory and, and, and making that indigestive feeling that many people get with aspirin, Philopendula has things that soothe the digestion. We've not managed to manufacture and create that yet, but that's how herbalists often use it, to soothe the digestive tract. Folklore surrounding meadow sweet, queen of the meadows as it's known, also says that if you inhale enough of its heady aroma, that was so rated by Queen Elizabeth, Edmund Spencer's fairy queen of his epic poem, that uh, it covered up the smell of anything else nasty in her chamber. But um, if you inhale enough of it, it said that you can bypass all the layers of science in your mind. You will find, once again, your ability to use second sight. You will, if you inhale enough meadowsweet, be able to hear the voices of the fairies. I imagine our Elizabeth walking with her young son through veils of meadowsweet, remembering the fairy stories she would have heard as a young girl growing up. Her walk takes her past the twining sticky willies growing up through the nettles, past the meadowsweet along the river bank, 
and finally through a hedge where honeysuckle grows and covers any bare branches. Honeysuckle is another one that we now rarely use in modern herbal traditions, but at the time was still hugely popular. She describes it as a warming and healing remedy. It's associated with calming the nerves and allaying cramps. Again, the folklore tells us that honeysuckle can bring true love and that if you bring it into your house, someone there may soon marry. It was also forbidden to young women throughout the 18th and 19th century to use as a scent or to wear. They were assured that it would bring forth rather licentious dreams and that therefore it wasn't appropriate for them to drape themselves with honeysuckle. Walking through the honeysuckle past the oxeye daisies which I, I brought in yesterday from my own walk through a nearby meadow dedicated to Diana and once known as moon daisies. These were used in 18th century Britain as bruise healers in the same way we use arnica now. Arnica is of course a close relative to the daisy. Playing love me loves me not whilst raising money with her herbal to have her husband released from Highgate debtors jail. Feeling the loss as he announces he's found a new post as agricultural advisor to the King of Sweden. It didn't last for long. She decided once she'd finished her, that once she'd finished her herbal, she would go out there and join him. But unfortunately, she lost at least one of her sons. A mother heartbroken, about to set sail and meet up with her husband when the news arrives that he's been caught up in a plot involved in the Jacobite rebellion and has been executed. She finds herself on our meadow walk as I weave stories around her herbal in a beautiful field of golden ripening barley. She draws that picture of barley and on the next page wheat, recording how they're used for health and then settles down, surrounded by scarlet poppies to draw very carefully each hair outlined Papavaraeus, the corn poppy that fills the field and the tiny blue dots like eyes peeking out between the wheat of Jumanda Speedwell. Jumanda Speedwell at the time was so popular as a cure in London that it was nearly picked to extinction. If you can imagine that blue flower that courses alongside meadows and through hedgerows, seems a pest by so many gardeners with its bright blue eye was once used as a remedy for eye problems and as I say it was used as a salad vegetable and was nearly picked to extinction however well a bit of folklore came to Jamanda Speedwell's rescue the word went round that whoever picked it risked having their eyes pecked out by birds popularity of picking Jamanda Speedwell kind of lapsed as word got round that birds were upset by this. Well, so I reckon. And of course it now flourishes once more. She takes that pencil and she carefully draws those poppies. She writes the notes that say that poppies are useful for bringing a restorative sleep. And as she draws even though we're separated by nearly 300 years, I whisper to this new friend of mine, Elizabeth Blackwell, the story of Ceres, the Roman corn maiden, the earth mother, whose job it was to look after all of nature, the wild things and the cultivated, to make sure that no one went hungry and that everything flourished. 
I whisper as the sun sets on our beautiful meadow about how Siri spent so much time on her own walking and studying plants, only graced by the most gentle of Zephyr's winds, but not alone. She had a daughter, Proserpine, and her daughter loved the wild world as much as her mother and wandered far and wide up remote mountains and down passes, but always making her way home until one day as the end of summer came. Her eye was caught by an incredible yellow plant, its trumpet-like blossom enhanced by a strong and extraordinary scent. How she was compelled to go to the plant, wanting to pick it and show it to her mother. She'd never seen such a thing before. But as she bent down to pick up the yellow flower, a clawed hand emerged from deep below the ground and dragged the young woman down below the soil. Ceres waited for her daughter to return and when she didn't, day after day, she started to search for her. She searched absolutely everywhere and the longer she looked, the less she was interested in the flourishing of the wild things, of the cultivating of the crops. She stopped listening to streams burble and plants grow. She stopped watching buds open and corn ripen. And she, in her mother's delirium, walked mile after mile just searching for her daughter. Eventually, as crops failed and the trees started to die back, Somnus gifted her poppy waiting for Ceres to walk through a meadow such as Elizabeth Blackwell and I are sitting in. He dotted the landscape with scarlet papaviraeus, the corn poppy, and gave them the ability to draw Ceres into a deep, relaxing, restorative sleep. When she awoke, she had renewed interest in her job. She started back to her task happily, tending the open eyes of the daisies and watching each bud open and scent pour out across the landscape. The corn ripen and people smile and laugh again. Eventually, one day, her eye was connected not only to yellow flowers flourishing that she'd never seen before, but to a young woman who was immediately familiar. Ceres found her daughter again, returned to her by Pluto. But of course, as some of you may know, Prospine had eaten four seeds from the pomegranate fruit. And for four months, at least every year, she had to return to Pluto's underworld. And then when she returned, her mother slept and winter took over the land. But when Proserpine was returned to her mother, Ceres awoke and took care once more of all the living things. I leave Elizabeth now. Having that beautiful, restful sleep. Papa Varreus is far gentler than its cousin, the... Uh, Papavar somniferum or Papavar orientalis, the opium poppy. It doesn't have quite so many um, addictive toxins and it was used throughout the 18th century and beyond as a restorer. It would bring sleep when you needed it most, when your life was full of grief and sorrow and hardship. And so I really, that kind of think, um, I'd like to leave Elizabeth snoozing quietly, recovering from her grief and her troubles, ready to take up the pen once more and start more illustrations of plants with the words of my story ringing in her ear, I hope, and um, Somnus's gentle restoring poppies in this summer meadow surrounding her. Thank you all very much for listening and joining my story and